Hi, this is Paul Turner with Venify, and in this segment of SSH 101, we're going to be talking about SSH risks and best practices that you can use to mitigate those risks. Now, in this session, I'm going to stay somewhat higher level. My goal, because there are, as you'll see, a long list of risks and, frankly, even more best practices, um, my goal is to help you organize those, to understand them at a high level and, and organize them so you can set up a strategy for addressing them. And in follow-on sessions, what we'll do is we'll dig into those individual risks so you understand them better and also the best practices. Now, another thing that you'll notice is that a lot of this is going to focus on enterprise environments, environments where you have multiple SSH servers. Um, as we go forward with this session or these, these segments, we'll actually cover individual servers and how to protect those. So we'll, we'll actually be addressing that if that's something that you've been looking for. So let's go ahead and jump in. If you've seen my last uh, video, the last segment, segment of SSH 101, you would recognize this, this diagram and it just shows several of the different components. And one of the things, if we step back and just look at this, we only have three players here, Sally and two servers. And with this, you see there's a lot of authorized keys, private keys, a lot of different connections. It's a lot to keep up with. Most organizations, because individual administrators are responsible for managing SSH, they don't have a central inventory. What they end up with is in a, an environment where they have multiple servers and such, they end up with a web of different connections. And because nobody's centrally managing this, they have no inventory of those. So now you have these trusted privilege access connections with no tracking of them. And by virtue of that, there's a, thing, a few things that come out of this. First of all, organizations don't want to change or rotate the keys. So let's take an example. If I've got this system here, right, it's got access to three other servers. And I decide, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and, and rotate this key because I, I want to, uh, you know, I had somebody leave the organization or, or whatever. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate this key. And by virtue of that, I, I update these two servers, but I don't update this server. Well, now, if this is an application that wakes up at one o'clock in the morning and does some critical function, when it does that, that connection is going to break and the application is going to break. It's not going to do what it was supposed to do. By virtue of that, what a lot of organizations will do is they'll have that happen once and then the IT folks say, you know what, that was a bad thing, that guy got fired, we don't rotate SSH keys anymore. So most organizations have SSH keys that have been out there for 10 years, maybe even longer. By virtue of that, you end up with a lot of weak keys. And this is not just key links that are small, 512, 768, 1024, but also you may have weak keys because cryptographic libraries were weak. For example, Debian had a bug that was introduced in 2006. For two years, weak keys were being generated, even though they were 2048-bit keys. And if you've had those generated in your environment and haven't changed those, you still have weak keys in your environment. So you've got a variety of risk factors there. You also have the challenge of terminated employees. Again, because organizations don't have a central inventory of these, they're really hesitant, or the administrators are hesitant, to remove any keys, even if they were uh, associated with a terminated employee, because they don't know what it's going to break. So they just kind of leave things in place. By virtue of this, you end up with a lot of potential backdoor keys, people that have left the organization and still have access to private keys, which would give them access to particular authorized keys based accounts. And finally, a, a really important one to consider is the pivoting opportunities that SSH presents. If you think about it, if somebody can take and get an entry point into your organization by phishing or some other means, and then they can start uh, leveraging SSH connections. They can jump from this system to this one and then start moving throughout the organization. Pivoting is a huge risk related to SSH. So now let's come back to this diagram and maybe let's itemize some of these risks as it relates to the major components. So first of all, as we mentioned uh, in the earlier session, in order to provide access, you need an SSH server. That's SSHD in the open SSH world, right? And one of the things you want to do is you want to make sure you don't have people just turning on SSH and allowing access via it because it allows attackers another entry point. So you don't want unauthorized uh, SSH use. In addition to that, you want to make sure that anybody that is authorized to put in SSH is keeping it up to date because there's, you know, as, as with air, all software, there's regular uh, vulnerabilities that are found, you need to make sure that you're updating to prevent those. 
You also want to make sure that all of your SSH configurations are secure. If you have an insecure configuration, that can really topple the security of your uh, SSH environment. On the client side, if you remember the earlier video, when Sally first connects, she's prompted and asks, should I trust this uh, public key? And if she's not careful about that, she might trust a rogue public key. Maybe what happened is that she had connected to a rogue server initially, gotten that key, and now it's stored in her known host file, and ultimately that can be leveraged by the attacker to do a man-in-the-middle attack. Now, that's a relatively sophisticated attack, but it is a risk within your SSH environments. In addition, on the client side, we've got this private key. Anybody who has access to that private key now can have access to the server through that account. So we need to keep that secure. And if we've got users that, for example, aren't, aren't putting in passphrases under uh, keys, or even if you've got multiple administrators managing a private key for an automated process, and they're, they're reassigned or even terminated, and you're not changing those keys, you have a significant risk of compromise. And another area that we've already mentioned is weak keys. If you're not rotating your keys regularly, you have the potential to have 512-bit keys, 768-bit keys, or even keys that were generated with cryptographic libraries that have bugs in them. And by virtue of that, that gives an attacker the ability or the potential ability uh, to take and use some sort of factoring to figure out what the value of that private key is. If we move back over to the server, SSH is providing access to servers. And one of the key things you need to, to be aware of is unauthorized SSH access. Again, if you don't have an inventory of your SSH environment, you don't know what access is being provided. So unauthorized access is a huge issue. One of the, the key areas of unauthorized access is root access. It's not a best practice to allow SSH access to the root account. But many administrators aren't aware of that, and they go ahead and allow that root access. And what this does is it allows an attacker to go directly after the root account over the SSH connection. You also have the potential, as we mentioned earlier, about ter terminated employees. And finally, you have the issue of the backdoor keys. You've got all of these authorized keys that are providing this access. You're not tracking them. How do you know that there aren't keys that an employee placed there because they wanted to be able to access that later? Or a, uh, an attacker is placed there because they were able to compromise an account temporarily, place one of these nuggets in there that they can come back and leverage later. One of the big issues with SSH is ultimately privilege escalation. Because you have administrators that have privilege access to begin with via sudo or some other mechanism, they have the ability now to be able to leverage that to broaden that access and to gain a, a broader foothold on that system. Another key piece with this is also the ability for somebody to configure SSH to do port forwarding. And I have a different video in this series on port forwarding specifically that you can look at. But port forwarding is a big issue because it allows people or systems to bypass firewall rules. And that's something you really want to make sure that you prevent. The final one, I mentioned this in the last slide, is pivoting risk. If somebody's able to, to uh, go from this client over to the server and that server is trusted by another system, they can go ahead and jump over to that other system. So with all of these, you look at this and it's like, wow, this is a lot of different risk. So if we take and we put these in a list and look at them all, again, pretty lengthy list, and then we juxtapose them with several of the best practices related to these risks, you can see it's an even longer list. And one of the things I've, I've struggled with is how to present both these risks and best practices in a way that's consumable to people that are trying to take action on them. And one of the things, one of the ideas that came to mind is, how, do, how about if we take all of the risks and place them across the top and all of the best practices and put them on the left, and then we can create a matrix where we can say, okay, this particular uh, best practice addresses these risks or vice versa. This particular risk, it can be addressed by these particular best practices. So it gives you a methodology for, first of all, prioritizing the risks that you want to address and then being able to identify which uh, best practices are going to apply and, and address the most, or vice versa. You may say, you know what, where am I going to get the biggest bang for the buck in the near term? And you can see, for example, 
if I do an inventory and I have an inventory of, of my uh, SSH keys and configuration, it helps me get a foothold on several of these different risks. Again, the goal here is to give you a high level view of those risks and the best practices and help you kind of prioritize them based on the mapping between those. As we move forward, we're going to dig into these individual risks. We're also going to dig into the individual best practices to help you understand how to implement them. So with that, I hope this has been helpful as a high level view of SSH risks and best practices and look forward to seeing you in another SSH 101 session. Thanks a bunch. Bye-bye.